What I'm interested in right now is um, John chapter 9. So let's turn our affections and attentions towards it. If you were here with us uh, last week, I started this chapter. And the entire chapter is about a blind man who was uh, healed. He was born blind, and Jesus miraculously healed him. And very, even this, the setting itself is miraculous. Jesus is being attacked by a mob that is ready to stone him to death. He's leaving the temple because of that. And as he's leaving the temple, he sees a blind man who is sitting there begging. And then instead of continuing to run and maybe even go back home to the Galilean region, he stops and he fixes his attention, his eyes on this needy individual. None of us would have done that. Particularly if we're running for our lives, we would have just kept going. But no matter how busy God is, he's never too busy for the most needy individual in society. And he fixes his eyes on this individual. And it wasn't just because of the man's need. It wasn't just because he needed to be healed. Everybody has some need, whether it's physical or emotional, mental, spiritual, financial. We all have needs. And God doesn't always just step in to immediately fix the needs. He's not a genie in a bottle like that. Now, he had a reason, a very important reason for why this particular day and at this particular moment, while the religious leaders of Jerusalem are craving and longing to um, murder him, he decides he's going to heal this man. And even his disciples, confused as to why he's standing and staring at a man who is blind, what, you know, what are we doing? They ask him the question in verse number two, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They're confused as to what Jesus is doing, and they're confused about why he's interested in this man, obviously as a sinner. Was it, is he blind because of his sin? Is he blind because his parents sinned? That was the common belief of uh, Judaism that day, that if, if, if there's something physical wrong in your life, it's because you did something wrong, and God's judging you. Or maybe your parents did something wrong, and he's judging them and you. And Jesus answers very simply in verse number three, neither this man nor his parents sinned. It wasn't because of any individual sin or sins that they had committed. We're all sinners, but that's not why he's blind. He's blind for this reason, verse number three, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Sometimes God allows suffering in your life to bring about salvation in the life of others. Because in your suffering, he can reveal himself. He can show his deity and authority over whatever it is that you're suffering through to reveal himself in you. And as God reveals himself in you, others get to observe it. Others get to see it. And this is the case here. God heals a blind man not just because he's blind, but because this is a prime opportunity. Not just to do good for an individual who needs good done to them, but so that he can show the religious leaders of Jerusalem who have 100% rejected him as their Messiah. He gives them yet again one more undeniable truth. He is their Messiah. He is God. He is the fulfillment of all prophecies, including those from Isaiah that talk about when the Messiah comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. And as he is running from those who are trying to murder him, and maybe I should rephrase that, Jesus never runs away. So he's literally just walking. He's not afraid of anything. He told him, it's not my time. Six months from now, I'll be nailed to the cross. I'm not worried about what goes on today. I must be busy doing my father's business today, which this would include on this particular day, healing an individual. And he does it, once again, so that the works of God would be revealed in him. That those that see him, and as we'll see today, interview him, will see God's hand at work. Undeniably, we'll see God's hand at work. And you would think... it. it I can't, it, it's mind-blowing to think of how the people responded. Once again, we're, we're talking about the city people of Jerusalem. 
Those in Galilee, they, they loved it when Jesus performed miracles, and they loved it when he preached and he taught, and they came by the masses to come and listen to him. And there's one particular point where they were ready to buy force to make him their king. But he's no longer in Galilee, he's in Jerusalem. Different crowd, different opinion of Jesus. There's nothing but hostility in the, among the city people. And you would think that a man that everybody has seen for years sitting by the gate, begging for money, who has been healed. And they know, well, I, I remember when he was a child. He's been doing this his whole life, begging for, for, for money, and he was born blind. Now he sees. You would think a miracle has really, truly happened. Let's celebrate, and let's find the individual that healed this man. Let, let's uh, praise the hero. Uh, maybe he's the Messiah. This is what the Messiah is supposed to do. This is what the prophet Isaiah said. Let's, let's uh, bring in this healer. Let's, let's bring in this man who opened the eyes of a blind, a man who was born blind. N nothing like this has ever happened since the beginning of time. So this must be the Messiah. This must be the individual. Let's celebrate. Well, none of that going on, is there? Yet, uh, you know, we, we ended at verse number 12. Verse number 13 begins with them taking the man to court. The man who was healed, because nobody knows where Jesus is at at this point. So they have the man that was healed, and they're taking him to court. And what you have here is John revealing why he's telling you this story. He didn't tell you this story to let you know that a man got healed. He didn't tell you this story to remind us that Jesus opens the eyes of the blind. That's not the reason for the story. The reason for this story is to remind us that there are those who are spiritually blind. There are those that are unbelieving. There are those that are closed-minded and hard-hearted. And no matter what they see, no matter what they hear, no matter what they experience, they will remain unbelieving. They will choose not to believe, no matter what happens. And that is at the heart of this story. This is why John is telling this story, is to reveal to us the, the unbelievable hard-heartedness of the people of Jerusalem, and, and particularly the, the religious leaders of Jerusalem, the Pharisees. And this is where verse number 13 picks up at. And as we kind of venture through the rest of the chapter, what John reveals to us is five characteristics of unbelief. Five, and this is still true today. You'll, you actually, as I read through this, you'll see the commonality in the life and the world that you live in today. Unbelief is the same in humanity from generation to generation. And there are five key characteristics that I see in this chapter. And, and just to be absolutely clear this morning, before I even begin reading these verses, when I talk about unbelief, I'm not talking about unbelief in general. I'm talking about unbelief of the heart when it comes to spiritual truth, God, Jesus, the truths of the Bible. That's not the same as unbelief. That's not like eating breakfast this morning and eating your toast and go, oh, I can't believe it's not butter. Or, you know, it's like reading the, the news this morning. The, you know, I'm like, I, I can't believe the Philadelphia Eagles made it to the Super Bowl. This, this is inexplicable. How did this happen? You know, it's, like, you know, it's, it's not like it's not like unbelief in general. We're talking about spiritual unbelief. And there are five characteristics to it that we'll see here. Verse number 13 begins the first one. Number one, unbelief creates its own rules for God. So many people will refuse to believe in God because they've created their, their parameters for God. They've created a box of which their God can fit in, little g. And when you begin to explain the God of the Bible... They cannot believe what you're telling them because they've already created the rules by which God must abide by. And so that's the case here. As you look at verse number 13, it says, They, the they is the neighbors, they brought him formerly, uh, who was formerly was blind, to the Pharisees. Now, why would they bring them or bring him to the Pharisees? Now, the Pharisees are the, the leaders of all of the local synagogues. And you need to understand a little something about the, the theocracy of Israel. It was that religion and government were kind of, uh, and, and really all social 
uh, interactions, uh, societal interactions, all were kind of together, conglomerated t- together. And the synagogue was uh, uh, the pinnacle of all uh, gathering and communication. And so anything that was social, anything that was uh, entertainment, anything that was religious, anything that was legal, the, the synagogue was where you went for that. And the Pharisees, the ones that were leaders over the local synagogues, they were the ones that would oversee the events. And in this particular case, as we continue throughout the rest of the chapter, what you're seeing is the synagogue being used as kind of a small claims court. And if a formal um, claim is being made here or any formal charges are being laid on an individual, it would move from the synagogue then to the Sanhedrin, which would be considered like the high court. And so everything, all issues and problems in society began with the synagogue and they would move their way through the system. And, and because this young man was healed, and unfortunately, as verse 14 tells us, it happened on the Sabbath. In fact, I say unfortunate. It's not. Jesus chose the Sabbath because he told this Pharisee so many times, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. He chose that particular day to continue to drive home his point. I am Lord. I'm Lord of Sunday through Saturday. I am Lord of the Sabbath as well. And so they bring him to this court to bring charges against this individual, and if they can find Jesus, to bring charges against him as well. So notice what they say in verse number 14. Now, it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. So so here's what's going on. A man has been healed. Some people are excited about it, but a lot of people are very concerned. Boy, this it happened on Saturday. And all these laws are being broke. And you say, what laws are we, are we talking about? Well, he lists those laws there in verse number 15. He, he, he put clay in his eye. Well, that's illegal. You can't knead dough. You can't knead dirt. You can't make any puddle of dirt. You can't make clay. You can't do anything like that. There are laws against that. You can't do that on Saturday. And then he anointed the man's eyes. And there's a there's a law of the Sanhedrin that uh, you, you can't put any ointment in the eyes on Saturday. And so that was clearly a, a prohibition, a, a law that was broken. And, and he did a healing. And you're not allowed to heal, which I don't know who's doing healings on Saturday. But according to their laws, you weren't allowed to heal on Saturday unless it was a life and death situation. And then you could intervene, intervene and bring some healing, but you couldn't do any healing on Saturday unless, unless it was life-threatening. And, and you, uh, then he also Jesus commanded the man to go down to the Pool of Siloam. Well, then that, that breaks the Sabbath day journey law, which uh, one-fourth of a, a mile or 200 cubics. You couldn't walk more than that. And so obviously the man broke that law. He walked further than he was supposed to walk on Saturday. And and he broke the law for sure because the, the command that Jesus gave him was to wash his face. And it's illegal to wash on Saturday. And so, you know, you, you have, you've, you've got all these laws that are being broken and people are confused. It's like, well, healing is good, but he didn't heal the right way. It wasn't life-threatening and, and all these laws are being broken. And I, I'm confused as to what's going on. We need to, we need to take him to the Pharisees. We need to work this out. We need some clarity on what's what's going on here. And so the Pharisees, they they look into the accusations that are being made, and they they look into the situation, and their initial verdict is this. This man is not from God. He's a sinner. Who cares if he did one good thing? He did it on the wrong day. Who cares if he healed the man's eyes? He, he did it by making clay. Who cares if the, the, a miracle happened? He anointed him with, in his eyes. Who, who cares if, if the man can see? He, he walked too far on Saturday. And so they're, they're just full of fury here that he is not keeping the Sabbath. And just so we're clear here, none of these laws are Bible laws. 
Nowhere in the Old Testament did it create all of these ridiculous, idiotic laws. That, that is, those have been created over long periods of time by the religious leaders of Jerusalem, and there, there are many hundreds of them. Because of the vagueness of the law in the Old Testament, which is to honor the Sabbath to keep it holy, the religious leaders question themselves over and over again. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to keep it? What does it mean to rest? What does it mean not to do any work? Well, is lifting your hand work? Is brushing your teeth work? Is making food work? Is walking across the street work? And, and they could just go on and on and on to no end about what work looks like and creating hundreds and hundreds of restrictions, laws. And if you break any of them, you've broken the moral law of not keeping the Sabbath. And so, unfortunately, this young man finds himself in front of the court and his only offense, biblically, is that Jesus healed him. And yet they're, not, they're going to be relentless on attacking him. And, and by the way, just as you read through the rest of this chapter, notice that they never deny that Jesus didn't perform a miracle. They just deny that it came from God. They deny that it, even at the beginning here, they deny that it actually even happened. And so unbelief creates its own rules for God. We see this in society. A lot of you, you know so many people who absolutely refuse to re believe the Bible because they've created their own belief system. They, they refuse to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior and as God because they've created their own rules about what he should be like. And they take one look at Jesus and say, well, his morals are actually immoral. He was a hater. And, and the things that he taught were blasphemous according to what is truly good, what is truly moral, what is truly loving in society today. And so they've created their own box of which God should fit in, and it doesn't fit the God of the Bible. Number two, unbelief denies the obvious truths about God. Look at the end of verse number 16. And others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. They deny the obvious. The obvious is that no one can make another person see by simply commanding it to take place. They're, they're, they're denying the obvious thing that has taken place, that God is among us and God is moving and miracles are happening. And number three, unbelief demands conformity. Boy, do we see this today. Look at verse number 17. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes. Now, they've already asked him, but they're going to ask him again, hoping that maybe some part of his story, there'll be some contradictions that they can call him out on. And yet you see the progression in the mind of this young man. Uh, initially, it was, well, a man named Jesus healed me. But as they're questioning and as they're talking about this, and, and as he's beginning to think about, I was healed, my eyes were made open. And, and as we talk more about this, I, it wasn't just a mere man. He says, he's a prophet. Now, things are going backwards for the Pharisees at this point because they were hoping that he would deny uh, any aspect of Christ being the one who performed the miracle or that he is God. And yet, instead of that, what you see is this young man saying, no, 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 this really did happen. I see. And the prophets said that this is what the Messiah would do. And even Moses himself in the book of Genesis said, there'll come another one after me in the future who will lead you into all truth. You will follow him. So this young man begins to think to himself, this must be the prophet that was talked about. This must be the Messiah. In verse number 18 it says, but the Jews did not believe him concerning that he had been blind and received his sight. They didn't even believe that it was a blind man, which to me reveals a lot of things. It reveals that they were so focused on themselves and so, so uh, oblivious to the needs of their community around them that every day as they're walking in and out of the temple, they don't even recognize this man. They're like they've never seen him. They've walked past him probably thousands of times and they don't know who he is. They're just, they've never once stopped for a second to even look at this individual and they say, you know, I, th I think you're lying. I don't even think you were ever blind. I don't think you're telling the truth. And it says at the end of verse number 18, until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? 
how then does he now see? So it's almost like, okay, here's your parents. They're going to tell us the truth. You're lying. You're not really blind. You weren't born blind. You're making it all up. And then his parents say, in verse number 20, they answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but what, what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. Now his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. So they, they came in fearful. You don't want to be excommunicated from the synagogue. That, the, in the Greek there, when it says put out of the synagogue, it's one word, it means de-synagogued in the Greek there. And basically what that means is um, it's not the same as like in a modern setting with church. If you're excommunicated from church, that just means you can't go to church anymore. Well, in the first century there in Jerusalem, if you were de-synagogued, that meant that you were, you were excommunicated from, basically from life. You couldn't participate in any civil activities anymore. You couldn't worship at the temple anymore. You couldn't pray. You couldn't perform sacrifices. You, you couldn't go to any of the town events. And you, you weren't allowed to get a job past that point. And not only that, you weren't allowed to have any participation within the Jewish community. So you, you became an outcast to your own community. And your parents were required to disown you. And for the rest of your life, you had to learn to cope and live within the, the Gentile community because the Jewish community has kicked you out. You weren't able to have a job or anything anymore. And so this was a big deal. And because of the fear of being excommunicated from the community, his parents decided we're not going to say anything that might be offensive. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to lose our place in the community. We want to lose our jobs. And what you have here is what you see so often, particularly in the days that we live in, unbelief demands conformity. When, when there are those that do not believe what the Bible says, and they do not believe in God, and they do not believe in Jesus, and they do not believe in the moral standard that is laid out in the Scriptures, they have their own morals and their own God and their own belief system and their own practices, unbelief in society almost always demands conformity to that. You believe what we tell you to believe. And your kids will be taught in school what we want them to be taught. And you conform at your workplace the way we tell you to conform. And we don't care what you believe or what the Bible says or what God you pray to. You must conform to what we tell you to conform to. This is what unbelief always does. Unbelief, just like all sin, sin, sin never likes to sin by itself. And since unbelief is the greatest of all sins... It's, it's one of the number one sins that the world loves everyone to participate in. If I'm not going to believe in God, nobody should believe in God. And if I'm not going to believe in the Bible, nobody should believe in the Bible. And if I'm not going to believe in the gospel, nobody should believe in the gospel. And so in verse number 23, it says, Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. And this, this is mind-blowing to me what they say to the young man. They see him. They just heard the report from his parents that, yes, this is our son. He was born blind. He sees now. I don't know how, but he does. So clearly a miracle has taken place, and clearly they know who performed the miracle, Jesus. So in verse number 24, so they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. Now, you and I, we read there, like, yeah, I agree with that. Give God the glory. But this is a, a common term, a common phrase that they would have used in this day and age. It, it comes from Joshua chapter 7 and verse number 19 and Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse number 16. And basically what it means is this. Omit the truth. That, that's what we're, they were telling him. Omit the truth. We know that this man is a sinner. So they come to the young man and they, they say to him, Admit it. Admit it he's a sinner. Admit it that he didn't heal you. Admit it that this isn't what really took place. Speak the truth. And they're forcing him. And so, this is the nature of unbelief in society and individuals. They always want conformity to their belief. 
Also, unbelief is irrational. Notice in verse number 35, he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. What a great answer from a young believer. He's like, I don't have the answers. I don't, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I don't know anything about this man. I just know this, that I was blind and now I see and he did it and that says the all that I need to know. That tells me everything. And so many times in, with young Christians in particular, they, they become followers of Christ and they put their faith in Jesus and their hearts are transformed, their minds are transformed, their lives are being transformed and then all of her friends begin to pick on them and their co-workers make fun of them. And then they engage in all of these conversations about how, oh, you're stupid and you're not following the science and you don't know what you're talking about. And look at all these contradictions in the Bible. And, and for so many Christians, the young Christians in particular, they, they, they don't know how to handle that. They don't know what to do with that. But I've seen this so many times. They end the same way. Well, you can say whatever you want and you can argue all you want. But you'll never tell me what happened in my heart. I was changed. I once was dead in my trespasses and sins, and now I'm alive. I once was spiritually dead, and now I'm spiritually awoken. I, I once knew nothing, and now I'm becoming to where I know, I see, and understand God. I once didn't have a relationship with God, and now I have a relationship with God. You can say, make whatever you argument you want, but I know what happened to me. And this is what he's telling them. Say whatever you want. You can't change the fact that I was once blind. Now I see. You're going to erase that? You're going to change that? You can't change that, can you? You need to accept it. You need to understand it. You need to believe it. In verse number 26, it says, Then they said to him, What did he do to you? How, how did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already. And you did not listen. Why, why do, you, do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Now you get to see a little bit of the feisty nature of uh, this young man. I love the boldness, by the way. His parents were, you know, they, they were timid. They, they were fearful. They, they weren't willing to speak up. But this man's heart's been transformed. You, know, you say whatever you want. I've been transformed. And, and you're, it sounds to me like you want to be his disciple too. Well, notice their response in verse number 28. Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. And this is the, the intellectual arrogance of this group. Oh, we, we know the scriptures. You don't know what you're talking about. We know the scriptures and we know Moses and we are followers of Jesus. And as far as this fellow, we don't know anything about him and we don't even know where he's from. Which is kind of funny because it's, it's a contradiction of what they said just a couple of days earlier. A couple of days earlier in John chapter 7 and verse number 27, this is what they said. However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. That's what they, a couple of days ago they said that. Now they're changing their tune. They're like, well, we don't know anything about him. We, don't know who he, we know Moses, but we don't know this guy. Well, it's irrational, their whole approach here. And I love what the young man says in verse number 30. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. And there are many passages that verify that truth. Job chapter 27, verses 8 and 9. Job 35, verses 12 and 13. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 29. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 15. This young man, who obviously wasn't a seminary graduate like they were, is telling them, this is a marvelous thing. This is a miraculous thing. You don't know your Bibles. You don't know what the Scriptures say. <laughs> you, you're, you're, you're telling me you don't know where this guy is from, and yet the Bible does tell us where he is from. No one can do what he has done unless he is from God. And not only that, but as he says in verse number 32, since the world began... It has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of the one who was blind. 
If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now, he's referring to the prophecies of Isaiah. Isaiah said in chapter 29 and verse number 18, and Isaiah 35 and verse number 5, and Isaiah 42 and verse number 7, as well as other prophets of the Old Testament, that when the Messiah comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. That was one of the signs. That when the Messiah comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. And this young man is saying, if he weren't from God, and if he weren't the Messiah, and if he was just simply a sinful man, he could not do the things that he did. It's a marvelous thing that you don't know your Bibles. It's a marvelous thing, you the teachers of the law. You who memorize and you who pride yourself on all of the knowledge. Oh, we know. We know. Oh, you know very little is what the young man is telling them. Or as Jesus so loved to say, you do err not knowing the Scriptures. They do not know what the Bible says, or maybe even worse, they know exactly what the Bible says, and they're choosing to ignore it. They're choosing not to believe. They're suppressing this truth. And so unbelief, ultimately, I think one of the greatest signs of unbelief is that it is closed-minded. Unbelief is closed-minded. Look at verse number 34. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. You know, here he is. He has made it very clear to them, this is what your Scriptures teach. Why are you not believing your Scriptures, your own Scriptures? And since they can't argue against the Scriptures, and since they can't argue against truth, and they can't argue against what the young man is saying, they just revert to name-calling. They, they, they just get angry at him and say, you're completely born in sin. You're born blind. You're a sinner. Your parents are a sinner. You're not going to tell us. We are righteous. We are the teachers of the law. You're not going to educate us. Who, who, do, who do you think you are? Come in here and tell us what the Bible says. Well, with that, they kick him out. And it doesn't mean that they just take him and they take him out of the synagogue. It means that they exercise excommunication. He's been de-synagogued. Meaning that he is no longer allowed to worship in the synagogue. He is no longer to participate in any of the city functions. He's no longer to have a job. His parents now have to disown him according to the rules. And this has been an emotional roller coaster for this young man for a couple of days now. He's sitting there at the gate, minding his own business, doing what he's doing every day, and Jesus comes by, and within hours he is miraculously healed. What a wonderful high, a wonderful moment. I can see! And then his neighbors find out about it, and it's like, that's great, but... It happened on Saturday. I don't know about this. And so now he finds himself in court. And then he finds himself being condemned in court as a spiritual criminal. You've broken spiritual law, their spiritual laws, and now you're a criminal and you're excommunicated from the community. What a, what a roller coaster of emotions that this young man is experiencing. Ironically, I find it interesting that on the same day that he is kicked out of the synagogue is when verse number 35 says that Jesus came and found him. It says in verse number 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him. It's a wonderful thing that when Jesus saves you, he doesn't abandon you. He can bring you to faith, and he can open your eyes, and he can heal your Spirit, but He's not going to leave you there. He will come and abide with you, and He will lead you, and He will disciple you, and the work that He's begun in you, He will continue to do in you, and He will always be by your side to lead and guide you because you are now His child. So He comes and He finds this young man, and He says to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? Some translations say the Son of Man, which is a reference to the prophecy of Daniel, that the, the Messiah will be referred to as the Son of Man. John always referred to Jesus as the Son of God because John is focusing on calling or pointing out the deity of Christ. Both are pointing to the same individual, Jesus being the true Messiah. 
and the Son of God, that He is the God-man that is with us. It says in verse number 36, He answered and said, Who is He, Lord? This is the young man. Who is He, Lord, that I may believe in it? I want to believe. Who is the Messiah? Who is the Son of Man? Who is the Son of God? I want to put my faith in Him. I want to believe in Him. And this is a sign of true belief. True belief is always ready for truth. It has an open mind that is always ready to receive truth, to embrace truth. And so Jesus answers in verse number 36, and he said to him, He who is Lord, or he or who is who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. You're staring at him. You recognize my voice. I'm the voice that talked to you earlier. I'm the voice on the Sabbath that told you to go wash your eyes and you will see. And now that you physically see, I want you to spiritually see. And in verse number 38, we see that true belief produces true worship. Look at verse 38. He says, Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. He worshiped him. And Jesus doesn't forbid him to worship him. There's all these uh, false teachers out there that says, well, Jesus, he's not God. He never claimed to be God, which is a bunch of baloney. And you have all of these times when people are worshiping Jesus, and he's never once telling them to stop worshiping me. In fact, that's exactly what he wants. Everything he's done is designed to bring them to the place where they see him for who he truly is and that they will worship him as their Lord and Savior and God. The thing that I find amazing here is this. On the day that he was kicked out of the church is the day that he found true worship. And sometimes you have, to, you have to remove yourself from religion so that you can find your relationship with Christ. And, and the moment that he got away from all of the legalism, the moment that he got away from all of the religious leaders and all of the religious heresy, the moment he got out of the synagogue, he was able to have a true and genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And he was able for the first time in his life to have true biblical worship of the Savior. So here he is engaged in true worship. And look at verse number 39. And Jesus said to him, for judgment, I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be blind. That is exactly what has taken place over these last 39 verses. You have the Pharisees who claim that they see. They are the spiritual insight. They are the ones who know the truth. And they are the teachers of truth. And they are the leaders of truth. And they are the, the, those that are propagating truth. Because they know all truth, and yet Jesus says they're spiritually blind. They have no idea what they're talking about. But those who are blind spiritually, those are the ones that I've come to open their eyes. Those that are humble, those that are meek, those that are ready and willing to have their eyes open, those are the ones that will see. Verse number 40 says, Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are, are we blind also? Like, you're not talking about us, are you? Like, uh, we're not blind. I mean, we've studied the Bible. You didn't even go to the schools that we went to. You, you don't know anything. You can't be calling us blind. You can't say that, you know, we don't know what we're talking. We, we are the experts. You're just a hillbilly from Galilee, a carpenter. You're, you're an illiterate nobody. What are... You can't be saying that we're the ones that are blind. And yet that is exactly what Jesus is saying because in verse number 41, Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, therefore, or now you say, we see, therefore your sins remains. In other words, Jesus said, because you say, I, am, I have no blindness that I see clearly, there's no problems with me, there's no sins with me, there's no issues with me, I don't need you, I don't believe in you, I don't trust you. You say, oh, I'm fine because of that. And Jesus says, no, 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 the problem is your sins remain with you. You're spiritually blind. You're spiritually blind and judgment rests on your shoulders. This is the problem that you see with so much of the world today. You can argue until you're blue in the face about what is truth and who Jesus is, and because they're so close-minded, 
Because they're, they're so blinded to truth, they don't want to have anything to do with your God or your truth or the Bible or anything that comes from the Scriptures. I think what we should be taking away from this is what Jesus said to another elsewhere. He said, be not be unbelieving, but believe. Believe. Believe in the things that I have said. Believe in me. Believe in the Scriptures. Just as this young man did. I see so many correlations in this, this narrative story of unbelief with these Pharisees. And I, I see it in the world that we live in today. I see it being played out in our our workplaces. I see it being played out in our communities, in our neighborhood, in our politics. Uh, this, this is so commonplace. I, I hope that as we were reading through these verses, you, you, you picked up on that. Remember, as Christians, our eyes have been opened by the Holy Spirit. Our eyes have been opened by the preaching of the gospel. Our eyes have been opened because of the, the providential sovereignty of God in heaven. We see the truth. We see Jesus for who he is. We read the Bible and our eyes are open, and yet we live in a world of darkness. Or as Jesus said, let the blind lead the blind. They'll both fall in the ditch and be injured. And that's exactly what will happen to the Pharisees. They will ultimately be judged by God, and those that choose to live in their own darkness and their own blindness, that is their future. But it doesn't have to be your future this morning. Once again, the truth is being offered to you. And the salvation of Christ is being offered to you. And you have an opportunity to not be unbelieving, but believing. And I pray that while that extent, that offer is being given to you, that you would not be like the Pharisees and be closed-minded and closed-hearted, but that you would embrace it and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ.